magic. It's everywhere. Magic as make-believe is an obvious staple of modern entertainment. On the other hand, belief in the real thing is actually rather common. Anthropologists, for example, study how shamans, folk healers and other practitioners of magic play important practical roles not only in non-Western societies. Even in Western industrialized countries, beliefs in things we usually call supernatural or paranormal are surprisingly widespread. Take the New Age market, for example, a major industry catering to vast numbers of people who might be critical of traditional religion, but still need real magic to make sense of the world. Sociological studies and surveys tell us all the same thing. More than half of folks from all educational and religious backgrounds think that telepathy, premonitions, ghosts and other weird stuff might be real. And many people even claim first-hand experiences. Still, modern Western education is more or less based on the view that belief in magic is simply wrong. And celebrity scientists only tell us what most of us have already learned at primary school. You can't believe in magic and science at the same time. It's often been said that to believe in magic is to simply ignore the past centuries of scientific progress. According to this standard view, it all began about 400 years ago when folks like Francis Bacon, Galileo, Robert Boyle and Isaac Newton began to expel magic by founding modern science. And when Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace formulated modern evolutionary theory in the 1800s, the disenchantment of the world through science was supposedly complete. But is this view consistent with the actual historical record? Let's start with Francis Bacon, who is sometimes called the father of modern inductive science. The trouble is that, like most of his scientific contemporaries, Bacon believed in witchcraft and phenomena we would now call telepathy and psychokinesis. What about Galileo, the classical icon that stands for the often claimed conflict of science with religion? After all, many believe that religion is just one form of magical thinking. Well, Galileo may not have been a fan of the Catholic Church, but like Copernicus and Kepler before him, Galileo actually believed in astrology and even cast horoscopes. Isaac Newton's obsessions with prophecies of the end of the world and his experiments in alchemy are fairly well known by now. A fellow alchemist of Newton's was Robert Boyle, who is often identified with the beginning of science as an open and transparent endeavor. But did you know that Boyle and some of his colleagues at the Royal Society tested faith healers? Boyle also conducted surveys of second sight or clairvoyance in Scotland, and he even supported research into poltergeist cases. Right, so, okay. These guys clearly just didn't know any better yet. After all, this was only the beginning of the Age of Enlightenment, when science once and for all vanquished magic. If there's one example that seems to represent how science prevailed over the occult during the Enlightenment, it's the famous refutation of the magical healing of mesmerism by a scientific commission in France, which included the great Benjamin Franklin and the father of modern chemistry, Antoine Lavoisier. But did you know there were other commissions that came to different conclusions? In the guise of medical hypnotism, the theory and practice of mesmerism was consciously purged of much of its mystical ingredients. And in the late 19th century, hypnotism was actually a major tool of psychological experimentation. This is also a crucial time when debates over stuff like clairvoyance and telepathy in the hypnotic setting once again divided academic opinion. These controversies persisted long after the formulation of modern evolutionary theory by Darwin and Wallace, which is now often regarded as the actual birth of what's called the modern scientific worldview. And Darwin himself was evidently very, very hostile to anything smacking of magic. But did you know that the other Darwin, Alfred Russell Wallace, was a rather enthusiastic practitioner of both mesmerism and spiritualism? And Wallace was not the only important scientist of the time who more than dabbled in spiritualism. One of the most famous mediums was Eusapia Palladino from Italy, who was investigated by major physical scientists like J.J. Thompson in Cambridge, the discoverer of the electron. Marie and Pierre Curie also experimented with Palladino. Now this was at a time when Palladino had already been called cheating on more than one occasion. So why did the Curies and other famous scientists continue to investigate Palladino and other mediums anyway? 
William James at Harvard is often called the father of modern American psychology. In his famous Principles of Psychology, James explicitly rejected the notion of a substantial soul. So why did James insist on the scientific importance of uh, the study of trance phenomena in the very same book and many of his other writings? Unorthodox activities have in fact continued up to the present time and have been studied by sociologists of science. Past interactions of science with the so-called supernatural or occult have been reconstructed by historians like myself. What we do is present our research findings at conferences and publish them in peer-reviewed academic journals and books. And some of the stuff I'm going to talk about in upcoming videos is actually taught at history of science departments all around the world. So why have most of these revisions of popular science history failed to inform common knowledge? Okay, here's another conspiracy theorist. Well, not quite. First off, the one thing I will never do is just tell you what to believe. Are any of the controversial phenomena we are going to talk about real? This of course is far from an easy or trivial question, but as a historian I just don't think it's the only important question we can ask. So if you expect me to simply claim, sure, magic is real, you might be disappointed. Sorry Gandalf. But the other thing I will never claim is that belief in magic is self-evident nonsense or just a form of religious fundamentalism. Sorry, Dawkins. Actually, no, I'm not sorry. If you stay tuned, you will hear me talk about scientists who were atheists, but still came to believe in things like, for example, telepathy, without feeling the need to change their metaphysical or religious outlook. And this is just one of the many previously neglected contexts in which belief in phenomena commonly associated with magic or the supernatural are not necessarily associated with religion. So what's the point of forbidden histories then? What historians like myself want is neither to validate nor to debunk magic. What we do want is to really try and understand the specific contexts in which scientists have believed as well as disbelieved in phenomena we usually call supernatural. And these are just some of the questions which have guided historical research and which I will also try to answer here on this channel. How did scientists go about investigating the claimed controversial phenomena? What were the specific methods they used? What theoretical frameworks were used by scientists who came to believe in the reality of some of the phenomena? What were typical criticisms of unorthodox science? Were these critiques always rational? Were there any religious rather than strictly scientific concerns that motivated negative responses? And how did heretical scientists respond to criticisms? What role have professional magicians, as obvious experts on trickery and fraud, played in these scientific controversies? What did words like supernatural, occult, paranormal actually mean in different times and different places? Debates over science and magic were typically shaped by cultural and political contexts. Is it possible that these past contexts continue to impact on the do's and don'ts of current scientific and academic practice? And not least, what can we learn from all this about the very functions of history itself? Who wrote and still writes histories of the relationship between magic and science and to what ends? And this of course requires that I will put my own cards on the table at some point and try to explain why I personally think that historical studies of magic and science are important. One of the general purposes of forbidden histories is of course to simply set the record straight. Because, you know, evidence is important not only in science. And that's why each video will be accompanied by its own article on ForbiddenHistories.com. There you will find references to academic literature, which you may find useful if you want to do your own studies. If you would like to start doing some reading now, you can find links to recommended books in the description box below. Naturally, all of the topics which I sketched today will be developed and treated in greater detail in upcoming videos. But if there's any other specific question you would like me to cover, just let me know.
just write a comment either below or on the Forbidden Histories website. Finally, of course, if you don't want to miss new episodes, remember to hit that subscribe button and also that um, bell icon. If you would like new videos and articles materialized straight in your inbox, you can also subscribe directly at uh, ForbiddenHistories.com. And that's it for today. Thank you guys very much for watching and I'll be seeing you soon, I hope. In the meantime, stay magical.